Well, good afternoon. Welcome to today's WISP Politics Lunch in D.C., especially our sponsors and special guests and all of our friends here from Milwaukee. Welcome, welcome to help celebrate Milwaukee night tonight. If you do have questions, I saw Andrew Davis. Andrew, do you want to raise your hand? <laughs> I'm a professor, I love putting people on the hot seat. So if you do have questions for tonight, please ask Andrew. This is our third of four events this year. My name is Wendy Riemann. I am your MC for today, at least until about 1235 when I need to go teach at GW. I know, sad, right? But my students have a quiz today and they would be really sad if they missed that. <laughs> but I look forward to seeing all of you at Union Station tonight, starting at 5.30 for Milwaukee night. It's definitely be a great, great time. Uh, huge thanks to our sponsors and partners for today's event. UW-Madison, I think I saw Cynthia here somewhere. Yeah, okay, yay. WPS Health Solutions, Michael Best and Michael Best Strategies, Excel Energy, and Marquette University and the Les Aspen Center where are all our Marquette students. Woo awesome. So the Wisconsin Alumni Association is also an event series partner and University Research Park is an additional sponsor for this event. We wanna thank the AT&T Forum and their staff. This guy can wave, yay, <laughs> for um, preparing this awesome space and lunch. We also welcome all of our local elected officials. I think there's a few of them in here. So would you please stand? Got a few of them. They're en route. Uh, <laughs> we'll see them tonight. We also welcome two guests today. Neither probably needs an introduction in this crowd, but um, I was reading through their bios and actually learned several things. So I'm gonna share some things with you because both have done super incredible things. So we'll start with Alex Lazary. He is the former owner and executive of the Milwaukee Bucks. In his role with the Bucks, he helped bring together the public-private partnership to build the Pfizer Forum and Deer District. He also ensured 80% of the materials and services for building it were sourced from Wisconsin and that it was built as one of the most environmentally friendly arenas in North America. It also became the first NBA arena to offer voter registration. Did not know that. He's a former candidate for the U.S. Senate, and when, you know I've done my background in campaigns and politics. And usually, when you talk to candidates, uh, they'll say like, "Oh, I visited all 72 counties." Alex says, "Oh, I pretty much visited every single quick trip in the state." So uh, he says he likes the food. They also have the freshest milk in the state. Um, so kind of impressive. He recently launched Next Wisconsin, a political action committee to invest in races for mayor and county executive across the state. And last month, he took on a role with the Democratic Governors Association as the organization's co-treasurer for 23-24 election cycle and was elected as a DNC member for Wisconsin. He worked as a special assistant in the Obama White House even more importantly for today's discussion, he led the successful bid for Milwaukee to host the 2020 Democratic National Convention. He served as chair of the Milwaukee 2020 Bid Committee and served as the finance chair for the Democratic Convention's host committee, raising over $40 million for the convention. Then COVID got in the way. Uh, he lives in Milwaukee with his wife, Lauren, and his daughter, Eleanor. And you heard it here first at WIS Politics future daughter arriving in February. <laughs> feel like we should end on that happy note, but I'll just tell you as an educator, he received his MBA from uh, NYU and graduated cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania. So we welcome Alex. While he makes his way, let me introduce a man who needs no introduction, but Ryan Spreebus. He currently serves as the president of Michael Best and Friedrich, a nationwide law firm with more than 350 attorneys. Prior to joining Michael Best, shortly after the 2016 presidential campaign, he was named White House Chief of Staff. Before managing the White House staff, Ryan served as the longest serving chairman of the Republican National Committee in modern history, raising over a billion dollars, billion with a B. Uh, and he left the RNC as the winningest chairman of either political party in American history. In 2016 and 2017, he was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. 
before serving as RNC chairman, Reince was one of the most successful chairmen of the Republican Party of Wisconsin. That's actually when I met him. And he previously served as a visiting fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School. He's currently an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve. He also served as chairman of the 2024 Milwaukee Host Committee for the 2024 Republican National Convention. He earned his law degree cum laude from the University of Miami School of Law. He enjoys watching Packer games with his wife and two children. And while the White House, Harvard, uh, Time Magazine's most influential are all impressive, in my opinion, you know you've really made it in life when the Colbert Report airs a new segment called What's a Reince Priebus? <laughs> Pretty impressive. Reince, we welcome you. <laughs> and then, last but not least, we welcome Torian Small to the stage. You can come on up. Welcome, welcome. So <laughs> we welcome Torian. Torian's going to be our moderator for today. He is a Washington correspondent with the Spectrum News DC Bureau covering the Wisconsin delegation. Now, Ryan is a Packers fan. Alex is a Packers fan. I'm a Packers fan. Torian comes from Chicago. So, <laughs> so we're all just going to be a little kinder to him today, but we still say welcome. He's a Chicago native, a Northern Illinois University graduate, and he started his political reporting career in 2015 as a multimedia journalist for ABC 57 News in South Bend, Indiana. So with that, I will say thank you to our panels and our moder moderator and turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We can have a seat. Let's have a seat. I think... We should be picked up on here, so I probably won't need this. Thank you guys for, for joining us for this conversation. And thank you guys for filling out this room. This is so exciting and awesome to see. Uh, we're here to talk about 2024 and uh, the conventions. Uh, I, I had the honor, uh, the opportunity to talk to uh, RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel, and she said she want to be really intentional about 2024. That's why you guys are starting and ending your nomination process in Milwaukee. Uh, they're really driving home that Wisconsin is the state uh, for next year. So let's start there. Why Milwaukee? Uh, well, first of all, thank you to WIS Politics and the sponsors. Thank you to you. Great to see the mayor uh, just walked in. He's been fabulous to work with. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I will say that one of the things that I think is important for everyone to keep in mind is that the what Alex and I did on the host committee and what I'm doing now on the host committee, it's a 501c3 charity. People just don't put that together, which means it's not political, which means it's about promoting Milwaukee. It's about promoting Wisconsin, promoting small businesses making sure that when you have delegations that come into the state of Wisconsin, that that wealth of that, what should be around $200 million in an economic impact is spread out uh, among those businesses. Uh, Council President Perez, I think, is he here? There he is, he's here too. So I gotta thank him as well. Um, but. And speaking of both the mayor and the president, that's one of the things that they talk to the RNC about and they talk to us about, which is spreading that economic impact around. There are 56 delegations that come into Milwaukee, and I'll keep this quick, but when I was chairman of Wisconsin party and we went to St. Paul for the convention, we don't just go to the the arena and go back to the hotel. Each state, hundreds of people in each state have their own daily events. They're going to this club for lunch. They're going to this bowling alley for a party after the convention. They get on these buses here. So imagine you've got 56 delegations doing 56 different activities all day long. It's up to the host committee and partners at the RNC to make sure that those buses and those delegations are going to all these different places. Now, back to the question. If the host committee and the RNC, host committee promoting 
in a bipartisan way, the city and the state of Wisconsin, and the RNC, who is clearly partisan, that want to take advantage of having the convention in Milwaukee, and that's what this that's what they're doing. And your question is correct. If all those things are working correctly, having a convention in a host city absolutely makes a difference in whether or not you can win that state. Thank you for being here. Um, so while the role of a host committee is charitable in its nature, the host committee and its partnership with the RNC can turn a purple state where only 20,000 people will decide who those electoral votes will go to. If you play your cards right in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin, the RNC can make a big difference. I firmly believe it made a big difference in Cleveland. I think it made a difference in Tampa. Some people will show you statistics that, well, it didn't really mean, you didn't get to where you want to go. But I think it's a matter of how do you do this job? You can fly, you know, you can fly in and fly out and whatever happens, happens, raise your money nationally and get in and get out. That's not gonna make a difference. If you play it right, you do the right thing, you promote the city, and you take to heart what the job is, I think it make a huge difference. Kind of the same question to you, Alex. I would imagine lessons learned from 2016 is why you guys made the pitch for the convention to come to uh, Milwaukee in 2020. I, I mean, the, the first reason we made the pitch um, for Milwaukee was because we wanted to make sure that everyone saw Milwaukee. And that was the original reason. Um, the idea was Milwaukee is this incredible city that was kind of, I think, at, you know, at the time, I remember when we were making the pitch, I think it was Vogue or Vanity Fair said Milwaukee was like the best kept secret in the Midwest. And the idea was, OK, you've got these big conventions, you know, Denver in 2008 for the Democratic Convention. You know, after that, Denver blew up and Denver is now probably one of the, you know, um, one of the biggest and most populous cities, especially for millennials and young people moving there. Um, after Charlotte had the convention in 2012, you saw the same thing. Philadelphia had it in 2016. And so I think our hope was, okay, can we make a pitch for a convention that one brings 50,000 people and $200 million of economic impact, but also shows the world that Milwaukee can compete for these type of conventions, that we should be able to um, take risks and start going after some of the biggest conventions that can be hosted. And the fact that we were able to land the DNC and then the RNC, I think, should show the world that Milwaukee is a place that you want to come to if you're looking for a big convention. Um, I think, and, and that was why when we first made the pitch, one of the first things we did was go to the Republicans and say, hey, are you guys in this with us? Because, you know, as Ryan said, there's the nonpartisan angle, and then there's obviously the partisan angle. But the nonpartisan angle is, this is a way for us to grow the city, to bring, you know, not just the partisan delegates, but you've got companies coming in. So companies that are maybe looking to invest in the city, or they're looking for their next big expansion. Well, they can say, well, we actually went to Milwaukee um, for the DNC and RNC convention. And like, you know, we had a great time. This is probably a place where we want to invest our next headquarters, or we want to build our next factory, or um, this is where we want to invest some capital. And I think on the on the nonpartisan side, that's what was so great about that, and why you saw Democrats and Republicans all in favor of bringing the DNC and this time the RNC um, to the city, because a lot of times there's the big nonpartisan aspect. On the partisan side, I think yeah, you look at it and you say, okay, this is a chance for us to show off. Um, and and really use um, you know and, and and show dedication to you know this state and show how much we care. And I think when we were looking at the uh, at the DNC, you know one of the things that we really loved about it was you know we can show off some of the great things that Milwaukee is doing, some of the great things that um, you know some some of the leadership that we've had to be able to say to the to the country, hey, this is why you know you should be electing Democrats and this is why we should win. Um, I think even having an RNC, and I think Rhymes would say the same thing, even you know when we had the DNC there, I'm sure Republicans looked at it as, oh, this is a way to draw a contrast, and now we can kind of promote our policies. Looking at the RNC coming from a partisan angle, very similar. 
right? They're going to be in, in Milwaukee. And I think this is a time where we can say, look, this is what Republicans are advocating for. This is what we're advocating for. And leave it up to the voters to make that decision. But, um, you know, I think no matter what, anytime you're able to bring business and people to the to the city, um, I think is great. And, you know, I know that's why the mayor, county exec, the uh, um, county chairperson who are all here, um, you know, we're we're so in favor of of just bringing business and bringing people to our great city. The DNC happened to to take place at the height of COVID. Um, so it was a very stripped down version of what I'm imagining you guys envisioned, especially since that moment where you guys shared beers to celebrate uh, winning the the host city. Uh, on the note of bipartisanship, were there is there any notes passing along to the RNC to say, hey, this is what we would have done differently, or this is what uh, you guys can can accomplish in order to, like you guys said, that bipartisan shared goal of promoting the city of Milwaukee? And look, we, you know, I've been in touch with Peggy. Um, anytime she has any questions, always happy to, you know, have been have been able to help. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the pitch materials that we used for 20s, uh, 20, uh, or 20s, uh, 20, sure where um, you know you just changed the D to the R and um, tried to do that. But I think most importantly, what we showed in 2020 was that we can host this. And whether COVID, you know, um, you know, whether COVID like took away our ability to actually have the big convention, the fact that we were awarded it showed that we could do it. And I think that then set the stage for, okay, great. We uh, we you know we went through the whole planning process. The city officials know what they need to do. County officials knew what we need to do. Law enforcement, et cetera, you know, visit. Everyone kind of knew what we needed to do. Now we already have that playbook. Now let's just kind of hand that over and, you know, let them, the RNC, um, tweak it, do what they need to do to make sure that, you know, it fits what they're looking for. But, you know, we've made sure, and I know with the mayor, the county exec, who are all deeply involved in the, um, in the DNC's bid, are doing everything they can to make sure that the RNC is welcome and um, and that the people coming are going to have a great experience. Because again, the better time people have in Milwaukee, the better we can advocate for more revenue, the better we can advocate for the policies that we're putting forth to help grow the city. Um, more people coming and saying, wow, Milwaukee's awesome. And this is a place that we can grow and people want to come and invest, the better. And so I think that's the biggest takeaway we had from it. You know, the parts and stuff, you know, we'll let the DNC and RNC take care of all of that. But I think from Reince on the host committee side and when I was doing it, it was very much a, how do we make sure that everyone who comes has an incredible time? And, and that's why, you know, uh, you know, even before we sold the team and the, you know, the, uh, the RNC was awarded, like, I think everyone knows we're a pretty big democratic family. Um, and we said, no, Pfizer reform is going to be used for the RNC. Go for it. That's going to bring 50,000 people, $200 million of economic impact to our city. That's great. Bring that here. And when it's time to get partisan, I'll say my piece. The RNC will say their piece. And, and afterward, though, hopefully everyone had one big party in Milwaukee. Yeah, that, that, um, but on this issue of bipartisanship, which is so true what Alex said, just keep in mind, too, from the Republican standpoint, we, from the very beginning of this process, have to work with Democrats in order to make this work. We, we don't, we, we don't, we're very few big cities we can go to that are run by Republicans. So from the moment that bid comes in, we're meeting with Democrat mayors and normally Democrat county executives. In this case, uh, Mayor Johnson was one, I would say, of the main, and, and the county exec, but was, Mayor Johnson was one of the main salesmen that made this happen. We had a dinner at Lake Park Bistro with many of the folks on the RNC, the voters, the people that are going to decide which city. And I have to say, the mayor blew them away. And they said, I love this guy. Uh, now, I'm hurting any future that he has in Wisconsin. Just say, we're keep, we're, we're, we're keeping him as a Democrat. <laughs> He's right. with us. But I will just say it's important to keep that in mind. It goes to the council, the city council that voted 13 to nothing. And a few of you are here today, and thank you. 
President Perez, that made a huge impact. When the city council came in and they voted 13-0 to agree to have the Republican convention in Milwaukee, I know for a fact that the RNC, that moved the RNC a ton. Because you remember, they were looking at Nashville. And, you know, it was touch and go where this was going to go. Um, so the bipartisan nature of this is important. When the DNC and Alex and others were organizing the DNC, I still remember my managing partner at Michael Best called me. And he said, listen, we want to get involved in the DNC convention. We're, we're downtown. You know, Michael Best, for those who don't know, is a big, long-time Wisconsin firm. Uh, we want to get involved in the convention. I said, absolutely. And not only that, one of our great partners, Jose Oliveira, mm -hmm. he was on the host committee itself. Our CEO of the host committee is Ted Kellner. He was the treasurer of the host committee for the DNC. And the great Peggy Williams, where who, it you know Republican, Democrat, WrestleMania, MMA, you know whatever it is, the aquarium. I think you had like the aquarium convention there, a couple, of, whatever it was. <laughs> it doesn't matter. She's going to put together the most unbelievable team and package that I got to see how Milwaukee presents itself on the national stage. And honestly, it's not because I'm up here. It was very impressive. And from the beginning to the end, Democrat, Republican, love Republicans, hate Republicans, it wasn't like that at all. It was very professional from beginning to end. And I, it's important to know that. So in my role, you all see me as like, you know, this partisan, hardcore Republican, similar to Alex, although Alex has got the business side in the city. I'm a partisan person who has a unique role of bringing this community together to support the convention with the help of many, many people in this room. Last thing, without the work that Alex and the DNC folks in Wisconsin did to bring the convention to Milwaukee in 2020, I'm not sure whether 2024 would have happened. That it helped pave the road for 2024. So that if there's an, you know, all-star games coming to Milwaukee and uh, in baseball, NBA, look how Cleveland exploded. Just like he mentioned, Alex mentioned Denver. All of it works to the good. So even though the DNC convention didn't happen, I know people were, you know, disappointed. We all were as a pandemic, but that work to get the Democrat National Convention to Milwaukee is all part of the same story to get us here and beyond in Milwaukee. I want to break up this love fest. We love hearing about <laughs> partisanship. It's important, but and I, I know, I know, I get it. Uh, but but you know, twenty twenty four is coming up, and and. I'm interested to know what do you think the party needs to do to flip the state again? Well, I mean, this is a conversation that, you know, it can go every direction and back again, and maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. But I believe that Wisconsin is extremely divided. It goes without saying. I think 20,000 people will decide the election one way or the other. I think it is a state unlike any state that I can think of. And I'm talking about from my position as someone who lives in the weeds, in data, in, in consumer data of people, what beer you drink, what car you drive, how many kids you have, how much money you make, everything about you to analyze what you're going to do and then target you on your door and in your mail and on your computer based on all the things I know about you to make you think something different. Wisconsin has two of the most sophisticated state parties in the country as a combination. Some states have great Republican parties or great Democrat parties, but this is a state that unlike any other state 
has the most sophisticated state party system in America. This is a state when you see polling and you see one Republican candidates at 48%, the Democrats at 48, and you got 4% in the middle. It's unheard of. So what that tells you is that this is an entrenched, decidingly uh, hardened electorate where very few people make the difference. So wedge issues matter, whether it be abortion, whether it be your position on Donald Trump, whether it is a particular tax issue that's taking over people's minds, those issues and how you target those 20,000 is what's going to make the difference. Increasingly in Wisconsin, the difference between winning and losing is the boring stuff. It is targeting, turnout, persuasion, messaging. And that's what will make a difference in Wisconsin in 2024. There are big issues and you can you know, go up into the clouds and start you know, hyperbole and all this great stuff you all wanna hear. But the reality is in Wisconsin, this is a hand-to-hand -hand combat state that's won in the trenches. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I look at it, you know, I take a little bit of experience from um, from when I just ran. And while I do think <clears throat> we are divided, I also think there's a lot more persuasion that can be done. And I think there's there's more there's more similarities to, I think, a lot of the voters in Wisconsin, whether they're voting Republican or Democrat, than I think we give them credit for. And I think one of the big things you know, President Biden's going to have to do. Um, one of the big things Tammy Baldwin's going to have to do, um, which, you know, the reason I think they've won before is because they've done it, is you've got to actually show up, right? I think that's something that's incredibly important. And, you know, Wisconsin voters, like, we make you earn it. You know, you don't get to just, you know, throw a TV ad or, um, and, and not show up in the community. You have to build that relationship. You have to build that trust um, with the voters. And, you know, when you look at, um, you know, kind of the history of the last, you know, eight plus years in Wisconsin, you've got a lot of Obama, Scott Walker, Tammy Baldwin, Donald Trump, Ron Johnson, Tony Evers voters out there. That's kind of crazy, right? <laughs> like if you think about it, because there's not a lot that, you know, brings all of those different pieces together, right? Like, but when you look at, 2018, Tony Evers wins by one, Tammy Baldwin wins by 10. That means there were a lot of people that voted for Scott Walker and Tammy Baldwin. And on the issues, you might think you couldn't be further apart than Scott Walker and Tammy Baldwin. And to me, what that says is that you have to go to communities, you have to show up, you have to have a relationship and a trust and and be able to talk to someone who's and say, hey, you might disagree with me, right? You might have voted for Donald Trump, but I'm Tammy Baldwin and I'm someone who's delivered for you. I'm someone who cares about your issues. And I think a lot of voters in Wisconsin, whether you always agree on the issues or not, I think if they can say, hey, you know what? I trust that you're gonna go to Washington. I trust that you're gonna be honorable. You're gonna care about our community and you're going to be accessible and trustworthy. Even if we don't agree all the time, I can vote for you. And I think that's how, you know, Tammy did it. Quite frankly, that's how Donald Trump did it in 2016. He showed up. And, you know, that that was a big deal. And people still talk about how, hey, Donald Trump came to my community. And while I don't agree with Donald Trump on almost anything, showing up matters. And that's a big part of politics. And I think sometimes is one of the things that we almost forget the most. It can be sometimes the most simple thing, but it's also the most important thing. Politics is, a, as Ryan said, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's relationship. And it's trying to build trust with the voters to say, hey, I'm here for you. And I'm going to do my best for you. And I'm going to deliver for you. And I think if we want to make sure that we keep Wisconsin blue, it's why Kamala Harris has already been out there. It's why Joe Biden's already been out there. Jamie Harrison, right? We're over more than a year out from the election and they're already all coming to Wisconsin um, to show that they care, 
that they're going to, that they've delivered for us and that you give them four more years or for Tammy six, they'll continue to do that. And I think that's the way you're going to win. Um, and, 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 and that's the way I think you can get those, you know, the, the, you know, as Ryan said, the, the winning is going to come from the, the Baldwin Trump voter. And can you get that person to be a Biden voter or, or not? And I think that's going to be where, um, where this race is won and lost. Yeah. The Senator calls it the Tammy Trump voters that she's trying to convert to Baldwin Biden voters. Yep. So we'll see what happens there. I think we're at that point where we can open it up to the audience for a and I'm looking for Jeff and cannot find him. All right. But I think there's a microphone at the most critical moment. (laughs) (laughs) It's fine. Uh, We have a a microphone at each table. If you have a question, just go for it. Good afternoon. Uh, First, Alec and and Ryan, thanks for being here. Good to see you again, Ryan. Nice to see you. Um, I have to, as as one of the old guys in the group, uh, some call it experienced, I call it old. I love hearing what you're talking about, and I love hearing it because it relates to us back to the days where we actually could work together, and while we disagreed, we did it respectfully. And I think that that's drowned out today, right, by all the stuff that's out there. This, the comments about the county executive and the mayor remind us that this can happen, and it can happen successfully. What, in your estimations, do we need to do to continue the drumbeat of this, the working together and getting things done while still disagreeing at points, but you're getting things done. And that is, I think, something that the voters don't feel is happening on a regular basis. Um, Well, I think, not to put the blame on the media, (laughs) but I think if the media would make unity interesting, it might make people interested in unity because division is pure profit. Dividing is what makes money. If, if someone wrote a book about here are the 10 horrible things done by the Republican Party and the chairman, and that book might sell, or here's what happened in the White House in the first six months, and here's all the crazy stories, that book would sell. But the book about what's going well or the book about how Republicans and Democrats work together for some good, that that doesn't sell. The split screen isn't there. Division is pure profit. Unity is a loser. So that's very difficult to confront. Um, But for the most part, I do events like this and with people like David Axelrod and Paul Begala and Donna Brazil, And they're great because people see that while two people might not agree with each other on a lot of issues, there's genuine camaraderie. People are decent to each other. I do a lot of events at colleges and we've got college students here. And for a lot of times a Republican and especially one that worked in the Trump White House, sometimes it's the tough place to go. But I always go. And the reason I go, I just did, I did an event with James Carville at University of Southern California. And the reason I do it is because I want the kids to see that it isn't always just horrible hatred and division, that there are people that most of the time we are getting along. Most of the time it isn't what you think. And so I think it's important for college students to see that. Um, but you're right. But I think if if somehow or another people cared about unity more than division, easy to say, but that would be a start. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think there's, you know, I've always said, and I truly believe, I think there is more getting along and more stuff getting done than we kind of give it credit for. Because all we always hear, you know, all we see is you know the yelling back and forth and everyone you know telling everyone how much the other side is terrible and all of that but when you actually look at you know at least this administration probably one of the most bipartisan administrations in terms of legislation that got passed in the last 30 40 years um when you look at some of the stuff that just happened um in wisconsin on the state level 
know, we hear a lot of the, you know, the, the, the partisanship that happens, but, you know, the mayor, county executive and the city and county just negotiated with, um, you know, with the Republicans in the legislature on a, you know, historic shared revenue deal um, and, you know, was able to, you know, pass a, a budget that was done by Republican legislature and signed by Democratic governor. And so I do think it's always, you know, look, you don't raise money or, you know, probably get ratings, you know, as Ryan said, by talking about all the good things. But I do think that's how you get elected, in all honesty. I think when you look at the, you know, the 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 races that have the most growth and that win by the most margins, Tony, Tammy, it's talking about the stuff that we've done together and how they've delivered and that they've you know, created results. And I think it's on us, the voters and people living in the state to say, hey, who I want to send to Congress, who I want to send to my state legislature, who I want to make our mayor and county executive or our council people are people who are trying to get things done. And I think in Wisconsin, especially on the city and county level, we've elected two people um, with the council. You know, we've got now leaders and Jose Perez and Marcelia Nicholson who all want to do things. And whether that means working with Republicans on the state level or, um, you know, Democrats on the you know city council level or independents, they want to get stuff done. Tammy Baldwin wants to get stuff done. Um, Joe Biden wants to get stuff done. And I think. You know, Tony Evers wants to get stuff done. So for me, my view is if we want more people in Congress getting along, if we want more people who are able to do stuff like this, you need to care about who you're voting for and who you're electing and saying, hey, these are the people I want representing me because you, you get who you vote for or who you don't vote for. And if we want more people doing stuff like this and our government to function better, um, We've got to make sure that we're electing people. And, you know, that unfortunately starts with all of you young people making sure that you guys are engaged and caring and paying attention and convincing your parents to vote for uh, um, people who want to get stuff done. Anyone else with a question? I first heard, my name is Bill Freud, that Milwaukee was going to try to get the Democratic National Convention. I said, huh? <laughs> I think it's remarkable that in recent years, both through the efforts of the people up here, that both conventions have come and that we as a community, whether it be Milwaukee or Wisconsin, have really put ourselves on the map. If 10 years ago I was told that the Democratic Convention would be in Milwaukee, and four years later, the Republican convention would be in Milwaukee, I would say I should check into the numbers. <laughs> I think it's a remarkable statement about what leadership has made a difference for all of you. And, you know, the mayor had a choice. As you recall, the mayor was under some political pressure mm -hmm. to say no to your convention. And he did, he did, yeah, the, right, he did the right thing. So I think all of them are to be congratulated. I'm sorry to be so positive. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's so fitting the theme, I think. Yeah. I mean, look, I think, I, I think the, you know, for I think a lot of people outside Milwaukee, it was a huge surprise that the Democrats, you know, that the DNC was going to come to Milwaukee. I think for all of us in Milwaukee, it was about time. And that was kind of what we were trying to push, which was, Hey guys, like I know everyone, you know, thinks Milwaukee is a suburb outside Chicago, but our goal with the convention was to actually show that Chicago is a suburb outside Milwaukee. And that's what we were hoping to show, right? And we're now starting to see it, right? The best player in all of basketball is in Milwaukee. And I remember very vividly the first time we went to play a game overseas, we played in London. And we were playing the Knicks, and we beat them by, like, 30 points. But everyone was rooting for the Knicks. Everyone was rooting for New York. Six years later, we went to go play a game in Paris, and everyone was rooting for Milwaukee. Everyone has heard of Milwaukee. Everyone knew exactly where it was. Um, that's 
what this convention, the DNC and the RNC is able to do. And that is why I think for us, what was so important about this convention, um, and both of these are, the window it gives us, right? It's not just the 50,000 people, the $200 million. It's also all the media that's coming there, right? Even just for the Republican debate, we had podcasts, every media crew, you know, filming, showing Milwaukee. And that's important. People hear about it and say, oh, that seems like a place I want to go, right? You see it on an incredible summer day and you're like, that's a place I want to be. I want to go visit there. Maybe I want to go live there. Oh, now I visited. Oh, this is a place I might want to go to college. Now this is a place I want to live and raise my family. And that's how, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. Milwaukee's not going to become the biggest city in the in the country overnight. But you give us 10, 15 years, we're going to be in that conversation. And I think getting the DNC and the RNC just shows that we can compete with any city. And it's not like we only beat out you know, cities, you know, uh, of that size. To get the RNC, we beat out Nashville, which is like the fastest growing city in the country. To get the DNC, we beat out Houston, Miami, New York, Atlanta, like not small cities. And that should show us and give us the confidence that we can go compete with all of them. And that doesn't mean we're going to win every time. But we got to show up and compete because we're going to win more often than not because we're better than all those other cities. Was that the strategy, though, real quick, uh, to have the DNC in Milwaukee suburb, Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> the 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 strategy for the DNC was to say, hey, we can we can host this event. And, you know, if we need to make sure that um you know we give also you know that and and chicago gets to get some of our splash great right more than happy to have chicago get a little bit of our splash right they they can get some of you know some of some of our excess but the whole point of the convention was to say hey i i know you've all heard of chicago it's time that you now heard of milwaukee and to be able to go somewhere and when someone says where are you from and you say milwaukee that they don't kind of look at you and you know, they, you go, oh, it's, it's just outside, you know, it's, we're an hour from Chicago. What, what we want people to now start saying is, where are you from? I'm Chicago. And someone goes, huh? And they go, oh, like an hour from Milwaukee. <laughs> right. We already beat them in every sporting event. <laughs> no offense, but we do. Um, you know, the, the next step is, uh, is, is, is becoming a bigger city. And I think with now the, the leadership we have, at the city and at the county level, um, I think we've got probably the best opportunity to do so um, that we've ever had. Another question from the audience. Go for it. Use that. Perfect. Hello, um, I'm Taylor Poplars. I'm a colleague of Torian's. I work with Spectrum News and cover politics. I'm curious for each of you how you think Joe Biden and Donald Trump are faring right now in Wisconsin. Obviously, Biden has been in office for a couple of years and has a record that he's running on. Trump has been facing some legal challenges recently, and that's been kind of consuming what the public is hearing from him. You could each answer about both, or you could answer about the candidate in your party, but how do you think they stand right now in Wisconsin? Can we go first? I don't care. Um, I mean, I think right now Biden's in pretty good shape. Um, I think the one thing you need to remember is this is Wisconsin. Um, you can be in good shape and it's 48, 48. And <laughs> I think like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we can look at, you know, and we all love to ride the polar coaster and it's incredibly, it's a fun ride, but at the end of the day, it's going to be 48, 48. And how can you then get either that extra 4% or even break through? And maybe get, you know, you know, eat into that other 48%. And I think the strategy that the president's doing right now, um, I think is the right one. Coming out there, um, sending surrogates out there, showing the people of Wisconsin that we're taking it seriously. And it's important to not just go to Milwaukee, Madison and bounce around there, right? We've already seen, we saw the vice president in Kenosha, um, making sure that, you know, Jamie Harrison went to Waukesha. 
um, making sure that we're going to Eau Claire and St. Croix County and La Crosse and um, Green Bay and to all parts of the state. That's how you're going to win. I think right now, look, I, the polling and everything to me is kind of irrelevant um, because I know that come September, October of election year, it's going to be close just because that's what Wisconsin is. Um, and if you put in the work now, it's going to pay dividends closer to election time because right now you're not asking for anyone's vote. Right now you're trying to build trust. You're trying to go to people and say, hey, this is what we've done. This is what I've done the last four years. Contrast that with what my predecessor did and start to build that trust, start to show, hey, you know, we've had one of the most successful administrations um, that, that we've had. Here's now our view, our vision for, for the next four years. Build that trust, start going to places before it's just six weeks before the election. Because that's when everyone's getting tired of politics, right? It's because all we're doing is either negative campaigning or asking for your vote a week before the election, asking for money a week before the election. You start building that trust now, start talking about the issues and what you're going to do to whether you're Democrat or Republican, and you actually start going to talk to people. That's how you build that trust. And come October, come November, when it's time to actually vote, people say, yeah, no, I remember when when Joe was here in in July of 2023. And he was talking about, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act. He was talking about bringing broadband um, here, talking about lowering prescription drug prices, right? You, you, you see that and hear that, and that's going to matter come September, October, November, when all of the negative campaigning is starting. And have you built up enough trust with the voters where they say, uh, yeah, I, I see what the Republicans are saying about Joe Biden, but I saw him, you know, two or three times this year, and and that's not the man that I know. And so I think it's been a very good concerted effort to visit, to buttress that with campaign ads so early, which is you know pretty historic. Um, and you can do again, you can be running an incredible campaign, and in Wisconsin, it's still going to be forty eight, forty eight um, come October, November. So I think right now, I feel like they're in good shape. Um, I think they're running the exact right strategy. Um, and I can also tell you that no matter what, it's going to be really close. And that's just how Wisconsin is. We make you earn it. Um, well, unfortunately for the Democrats, I think they're stuck with the candidate they've got. Uh, they're, they've chosen the wrong person just like they chose the wrong person when you ran um and they're going to be stuck with a candidate who's in far worse shape today than he was in 2020 you can say what you want about donald trump love him hate him he's the same as he today as he was when he came down the escalator in 2015 people have 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 opinions on him that are very clear it goes without saying but president trump won wisconsin in 2016 by 20 some thousand votes he lost wisconsin in 2020 by 21 22 000 votes my point a half an hour ago but the difference, though, too, now is that 74% of Democrats say that they wish that they had someone else running besides President Trump or President Biden. Biden approval rating is 20 points worse, as I just said today, than it was in 2020. And I think Republicans have woken up to early vote, absentee ballot voting, all the boring stuff that I talked about earlier targeting data turnout um that all being said i come back to what alex said and what i said right off the bat this is going to come down to twenty thousand people persuasion targeting and turnout and uh and the one thing for sure is true no electoral math works for either party without wisconsin mm -hmm. But it brings us full circle back to the convention, back to the host committee, the RNC, how you're perceived in the state, 
if you're perceived positively in Milwaukee and Wisconsin with only so few people to move, it can make a huge difference. And so that's why this convention, what the RNC is doing in Wisconsin's role in 2024, all work hand in hand. Uh, and, and again, it all comes down to Wisconsin. I have to ask you about that early voting. You said Republicans are wising up to that. Um, I know with Milwaukee, Wisconsin was first picked by the RNC to launch the Bank Your Vote initiative, um, targeting you know early voting for, for uh, Republicans. But for so long, you've had Republican candidates say that this is you know ripe with fraud. Um, how do you change behavior uh, or the mentality of Republicans to participate in this when it's been for so long condemned by the top of the party. Yeah, well, I, can, I really commend uh, the chairwoman, McDaniel, the RNC, for launching this bank, your vote. I think that it to Alex and the Democrats, it's like, why wouldn't you? I mean, we've been doing this for 10 years. Um, Republicans have to start stop whining and complaining about early vote and absentee ballot voting and just start doing it and get better at it. It's here to stay. People like it. They like the idea of voting early. They like voting from their home. And the Republicans have to adapt. So to your point, though, which I think is extremely important and missed by Republicans especially, you can launch whatever initiatives you want. But if you don't spend the time, money, and energy in educating your voters, I'm talking about Republican voters now, about why they should vote early, why it's important to get the likely Republican voters out of the way so you can focus on the sometimes voters on Election Day, that's why you need to do it. So it's going to take the entire Republican ecosystem to change its ways and change their opinions about early vote and absentee ballot voting. It used to be back when I was running the college Republicans that if it snowed in Wisconsin and say an April election, we'd say, oh, great, Republicans have an advantage because a lot of the Democrats, they might not go or you know the turnout's gonna be, Democrats are much higher turnout in presidential elections than midterms. Or, or spring elections. Now, if there's a snowstorm, the Democrats are like, oh, we got them because the Republicans all waited until election day. So the mentality, you're exactly right. It's turning the mentality of the Republican voter to understand that taking likely Republicans off the board early gives us an advantage on election day to focus on the persuadables and the ones that are a little bit more on the fence. It makes sense. And that's what the challenge is for the Republican Party. Alex, to get you in here, if they are able to change that behavior, is that something Democrats should be concerned about? I, I mean, I don't think so, because at, at the end of the day, it's it's still a choice on policies. And... I think, you know, even when you look at the 2022 election, I, I'm pretty sure it was a more our electorate than it was Democrat electorate. Um, but what ended up happening was, especially in Tony Evers' race, like more R said, hey, we want Tony Evers than, um, than, uh, than Michaels. And I think same thing in 2020. Right. More people said, hey, I want Joe Biden over Donald Trump. And I think at the end of the day, look. When you get out to vote matters, voting matters. But what I am a firm believer in, and you know, I hope it's not just pure na naivete and like, you know, Aaron Sorkin West winginess. But <laughs> I do I do believe that voters are pretty smart. I do believe that like we need to give voters way more credit for knowing who the candidates are and and where candidates stand on issues and how they feel about them. And I think you know whether Republicans are are banking their votes early or not to me is 
is going to be irrelevant so long as you know we're able to draw the contrast and show what it is that Democrats want to do versus what Republicans want to do. And um and and to me, I think that's the most important thing. I also think, you know, it's very hard to get people out to vote when the leader of your party is constantly saying that these elections are stolen. And I think that's something that, you know, I think Republicans need to figure out, which is, you know, it if I, you know, if we were playing, you know, if we owned a basketball team and, you know, everyone, and we just kept saying, all these games are rigged, don't play, this is all terrible, our guys would have no motivation to go play. So I think we've got to make sure that we're, one, grappling with the idea that, hey, these are free and fair elections and getting back to the point of, hey, you know, as Ryan said, like, if you lose, you lost. Do better next time. And I think that's something that we all need to, um, and and especially someone on the extremes need to do a better job of just being like, hey, you know, we all we all fought, we gave our best, we lost. Time to turn around and do better the next time. And I view it as, um, at least over the last you know six eight years. Um, if we're able to get our message out and, and really draw that contrast, I, I feel confident about our ability to uh, to win. Yeah. With that, I'll put a pin in this conversation like we all can agree on. The road to the White House runs through Wisconsin. But for now, I want to thank this panel for joining us. Why don't we give them the money? Yeah, let's start with you. Let's turn over to Jack May if you got some, some words for us. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Torian. Thank you, Lawrence Priebus and Alex Lazary. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Michael Best, Michael Best Strategies, WPS Health Solutions, Excel Energy, Marquette University, and the West Aspen Center, and the University of Wisconsin. And uh, the Wisconsin Alumni Association is a event series partner, of course. And I uh, want to thank the Milwaukee uh, area elected officials who are here, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. County Executive, uh, Madam uh, Council Chair, and the uh, Council President. Thank you very much for attending. And remember MMAC's Milwaukee night. Uh, that's uh, uh, tonight, 5.30. If you have any questions, see Andrew Davis, and he'll uh, get you straight on it. All right, thanks, everybody. We're going to have a fourth one of these. Um, sometime this fall, and uh, just uh, stay tuned to wispolitics.com, and uh, we'll get you uh, um, get you back here uh, to uh, see a new program. So thanks very much, everybody, and we'll see you next time.